It's your open source advocate and I'm back with part two of True NAS and today we're going to talk about what the dashboard looks like once you add storage to it and a little bit more about the dashboard itself. On top of that I'm going to go through a little error that I came across with a USB drive while I was getting things kind of started and set up for the system that we've been running and I'll, I'll briefly touch on plugins again a little bit before we get into part three where I actually do a plugin install and setup for you guys. I hope you'll enjoy it and stick with me. We'll get started right after this. I want to say thank you to all of my subscribers and all of my patrons over at Patreon. Seriously, you guys make this so worth it for me to do these videos every week. I really truly enjoy it and I just can't say thank you enough. If you're enjoying these videos, subscribe. Let YouTube know that I'm doing a good job by subscribing to the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when I have new videos coming out. And finally, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, Give it a like, just click on that thumbs up, and that way YouTube knows that you like it, and they'll pass it along to other people that might enjoy my content as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Let's get started. Really, you should do something a little different than me. I went and, and did some setup first, but if you really want to make sure everything's working, uh, make sure that your storage de devices are there. So you can click on storage and then pools, and then just click on add. You're not really going to add a pool yet if you're just checking, but you want to click on add, and then you want to say create a pool and look to see if you see the storage devices you're expecting. So in this case, I am expecting a three terabyte drive, which is great. This is not the pool that I created before. This is an actual hard drive that has three terabytes of space on it. And then also this seven terabyte drive. So I took out the two terabyte, replaced it with a three terabyte, and then I have some, uh, some, some USB drives hooked up, but I'm gonna be doing some testing with those here in a minute. But I do see the drives that I expect, which is great. And now I can start actually creating storage spaces and things like that with TrueNAS. And I have that in the in the video that you guys uh, will see soon. Uh, if depending on how I do this, I'm doing everything out of order when I'm recording this, so it's a little bit crazy for me to think about how to talk about it. But you'll you'll see kind of how to how to mix drives into a pool, and then also to to create that pool and use it for striped or mirrored data, and so on. So so I'm going to come back and, and talk about that in a little bit. But I do see the storage devices I detect or I, I expect right now, which is good. And then I'm going to go over and I'm going to turn on a USB drive here and see if I see it show up, which is what I want. So I went over, I physically have turned on that drive. Now, it may not just pop into the view here because this isn't just listening as far as I know. Um, it may take a second. So I'm going to give it just a second to get detected, get brought up in the system, everything like that. And then once I kind of see it stop with the uh, activation lights, hopefully everything will look good. And we can just refresh this view and see if it's actually now seeing that drive as well. So you see I get this notification that says, True NAS detected that I added a new drive. So that's great. I've got this notification, so it detected that. Cool. So I'm going to go back here, and I am going to say refresh. And it's going to make me log back in. That's okay. Um, if it sits too long, it'll make you log back in when you start trying to do certain things. But you see now, I see this one that says unknown. And it's because it's not seeing it as an internal drive. So again, the ADA sees it as an internal drive. The DA appears to be the moniker for USB drives. But it's a one terabyte drive. So now I've got that drive. Now, I'm going to do something that I think is creating problems. I have another hard drive in the same type of enclosure, but it's a different hard drive. And I'm going to turn that on. And we're going to see if it detects both of them or if it still only detects one of them. Um, and then I'll turn the other one off. We'll, we'll just kind of do some testing here. So I'm going to click on this drive. I'm going to give it just a little bit of time here. So on the last one, I could see the light flashing as it was being detected, you know, everything like that. So I'm kind of watching for that over to the side. I know you guys can't see that, but I'm kind of watching for that. Um, and it, you know, it kind of tells me, and then of course I got the email that said, hey, I detected a new drive. So we'll see if we get that or if it just kind of confuses the system that I've got two drives that it thinks are the same. So far I haven't seen anything that says, yep, you got another one here. So that's a little concerning. Yeah, so I can see, so I'm, I'm looking at the actual screen. I've still got it hooked up to the, to the actual um, system. And on the screen, I've got it where it's scrolling the console information, and I can see that it sees the serial number exactly the same for both drives, which is not good, right? It, it, it can't tell that this is two different drives, unfortunately. So that's, that's kind of a bad thing. Um, you need different types of enclosures, I think, really to solve that problem. But, but there's, a, there's an issue with that, because if you want to use like something like a, 
a drive bay where you could hold four or eight drives. I don't know that this it's going to work unless there's a hardware RAID built into that type of drive bay. Um, the good news is, is I have another drive box here that I can set up and get turned on and, and try to use it to push these drives onto the system. And I think I'll do that and then we'll come back and see if it detects that in a separate drive box. Okay, so I've hooked up two other drives. Uh, the one terabyte USB drive was just giving me some issues. So for now I've disconnected it, but I've got this uh, 700 gig drive that's uh, hooked up. And then I've got this two terabyte drive that's also hooked up. So these are both hooked up through USB in two different enclosure types to make it simple for uh, TrueNAS to tell the difference between them. So having different enclosure types can really help with that. Now you wanna be careful. Um, some external hard drives that you buy just kind of pre-done have sleep modes built into their chipsets that are inside of those drive bays <clears throat> and it's something you can't override easily so those things will go to sleep and TrueNAS will think that it lost it and all that. So it's just a bunch of stuff. It's better to buy a hard drive and just buy a, you know, a regular USB 3 case and put it in it and, and attach it. But if you're going to do it, look for the ones on Amazon that are different or on Alibaba or wherever you're shopping. You know, look for ones that are different so that they'll pull different serial numbers and that will really help with identifying those drives. And this is the case not in just TrueNAS, but um, in Rockstore and, and in other systems the same way. So, so just be aware of that. If you want to buy USB drives, you want to buy a bunch of different ones, don't, don't, don't buy a bunch of the same drive enclosure. So like I've got three of the same drive enclosure sitting over here. Two of those are no good to me for this purpose. Now I can use them for other machines, so totally worth it. So we've got set up and we've got our drive set up and we've got a couple of pools set up and you can see those here so they tell you whether they're on or off. A little bit of information here on the dashboard about those pools. So the first time you load you just see these four tiles and now you've got some extra tiles with your pools and as you add more pools then you'll see more tiles showing up. One of the things we want to do with these pools is actually go create a share. So I'm going to go here to storage and just let you see the pools that I've got. And again, you can see some overview information about whether they're online or offline. And I'll zoom this back up a little bit. Um, so online has a check, which is a good thing. And it tells you what's going on here. And megabytes, 0% used, 2.47 terabytes free. And down here, 2.6 terabytes free. So I've got, you know, the, the pool that has the extra stuff going on here, where I've got some extra shares or extra storage spaces set up for backups. And then I've got this one down here that I created that's going to be my main Mac backup. And I'm going to go down and actually just close up storage. I'm going to go to sharing and you'll see you've got a few different options here for setting up shares. So you've got Apple file protocol, you've got the block shares, you've got Unix shares, so the NFS file uh, network file system. And then you've got WebDAV if you want to set up WebDAV shares. And then finally, Windows Server, SMB, or Samba shares. So Apple switched over to using Samba way back in 2013, and they started deprecating AFP. Um, I'm not sure if I can use Time Machine to, to back up to, to Samba, honestly, but I'm going to give it a try. So I'm going to create a Samba share here. And I'm going to go and say add. Uh, in fact, let me go back. Hang on. Let me go back to Samba shares. Yeah, so if you get here and you don't have anything, you don't have any shares set up yet, so we're going to click on Add. We're going to give it a path for our Samba share, so you can just click here. And we're going to go down, and I'm going to pick this one that says 3 terabyte drive, and then MacBook Backup, and then there's nothing under it, so I'm going to select that. So there's my path for this share, and then it's giving it the name MacBook Backup, and basically you've got this option that says Purpose, Delete, Share, Perimeters, Parameters, um, and then over here you've got description. So I don't want to delete the share parameters. So this is a multi-user time machine, multi-protocol AFB SMB shares, multi-protocol NS, uh, NFS V3 uh, Samba shares, so your network file system version 3 and Samba shares, private Samba data sets and shares, and then Samba worm files become read-only via Samba after five minutes. So. So we've got these different options here and I'm going to go down and I'm going to say let's make this a multi-user time machine. So here we go. And then over here in description I'm going to be like TM underscore backups. Something like that. And then it's going to say enabled or not. Yes, we want that to be enabled. Now you have advanced options so we can click on that and check out what those are. 
So you've got enable access control list, and if you click, it'll tell you a little bit about what that does. So enable access control list support for the Samba share. Disabling ACL support for a share deletes that ACL. Um, so then there's also export read only. So you've, you've got quite a few options here. You've got browsable to network clients, which means whenever you, it'll be pushing itself or, or um, transmitting itself out there for you to find. Allow guest access access based shared enumeration and then other options is the user is this used as a home share and you know we don't want to do that but time machine we want to do enable shadow copies if we want to export the recycle bin use apple style character uh, encoding I, I don't really know that we need yeah. enable alternate data streams and then enable SMB 2 and 3 durable um, handles and finally enable file system uh, FSRVP which I'm not sure what that is but we can click so file server remote VSS protocol this protocol allows RPC clients to message snapshots or to manage snapshots for a specific Samba share the share path must be a data set mount point snapshots have the prefix FSS followed by a snapshot creation timestamp a snapshot must have this prefix for an RPC user to create it. So you can enable that if you want to. I'm not going to use that one. And finally, you have auxiliary parameters that you can put in as well as a path suffix if you want to. So I'm not going to do any of those things. I just want to let you see the advanced options. I'm just going to go back to basic options and I'm going to click on submit. And it says restart the SMB service, which says enabling time machine on an SMB share requires restarting the SMB service. So we're just going to click on restart the SMB service here. It says the SMB service has been restarted. Okay, great. And it says enable service. So enable this service to start automatically. Yeah, I, I probably want that. So in case I reboot the machine, it starts up on its own. And then the SMB service has been enabled. Great. So configure ACL. So configure permissions for this shares data set now. Let's go ahead and see what it says here. It says select a preset ACL or create a custom ACL. So we'll just say select a preset. Uh, open, restricted, or home. So let's just call this home. Continue. Now, there's a couple things that we want to set up here, and I want to change this to be permissions for my user and not the root user. And then on wheel, I don't know if I need to leave that or not, but I'm going to change that to my group as well so that I own the share. Um, access control list will say, you know, who who is it that's going to own this thing, the owner, the group, or everyone. So in this case, it's got owner. Um, and it says allow as far as ACL type. And I know this is really small. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make this a little bit larger. So ACL type is allow. Permissions type is basic. And then permissions full control. Um, flag type is basic. And flags are inherit. As you move down, again, who, uh, you know, group, allow, basic. So it sets it up for the, the thing and then everyone. So it's basically setting up. Your, your permissions that everyone can see and, and do what they need to with this share. So I think I've got everything set. I don't need to select a, a preset there. We can say apply permissions recursively. It's going to give this warning again. Affects the directory and any others below it. This uh, you know can make data inaccessible if you do something that you didn't mean to do. Um, in this case, I'm just going to say confirm because I don't have any data on there yet. And then we're going to save and now we've got a share set up. So here we can see the share that we've got. We'll go back to shares and we'll go back to SMB. So here we can see that we've got this share set up. So now I want to go over to my Mac and try to set up Time Machine to back up to that share. So I'm going to switch out where I'm recording and then I'll be back. So I've got settings open and I'm going to go down and I'm going to click on Time Machine. And then I'm going to click here on this button that says select disk. Now I've already got a USB drive set up, but I want to add an additional backup, which is this TrueNAS storage that I set up earlier. So I'm going to select that. I can tell which one it is here because it says TrueNAS. And then I'm going to say use. 
Now once I get to here, it's going to let me know that I actually already have a disk in place, and it's going to ask if I want to switch out what disks I'm using or if I want to use both. And in this case, I want to use both disks so that I have a USB backup as well as my TrueNAS backup so that I've got redundancy going on for my backups here. Once I select that, it's going to come up and it's going to say, hey, you need to kind of log into this machine. So it wants to know my credentials for that. So I'm going to bring it up. I'll put in the credentials for my actual machine that's the TrueNAS machine for my user that I created earlier. And it's telling me that it's uh, having a hard time connecting to that machine, and I'm not sure why, so I'm going to go back and then I'm going to reboot my system and see if I can figure out why it's giving me that message. Um, apparently, I, I may just need a reboot on this Mac here. So I've got this back up, and I'm going to go back and reselect the TrueNest drive. I just rebooted this Mac. We'll kind of go through the same sequence that we did before. And again, we'll come here and say we want to use both drives. And it's going to go out and ask, and it's going to prompt for the credentials. So I'll type in the correct credentials for my registered user on the TrueNAS system. There we go. So now I'm set up to do a backup through this system over back to my TrueNAS system, which is great. I've got a network set up, and I've got the main USB set up and everything should be running. It'll take a minute for it to prepare the actual time machine backup, but we'll switch over and look at the activity that's going on on the TrueNAS machine now that we've finished this part. Okay, so we're back over on this machine now, and you can see that there is just a little bit of activity, so we've got the CPU going up at 1%. Uh, we don't have much going on here right now, but we did get a little bit of activity uh, whenever the time machine started trying to make its backup, and I don't think it's done yet, so we'll give it a little bit more time here. Yeah, so there we can see a little spike in activity on the Ethernet uh, port where the Apple machine is trying to connect with it and make sure everything's there and ready to go. And it kind of hits and goes back and hits and goes back, but it may be starting the actual transfer of data. It still says preparing backup, so I'm not sure if it's there yet. It may just be checking the system, but there you can see quite a bit of activity coming in. So it's 340 40 kilobits per second, megabit per second. Um, so that's usually you know, pretty pretty decent speed for, for data transfer. So I think we've got things running there. So that's kind of how you set that up. Um, sorry for the confusion. I just had to reboot the Mac to get it to kind of kick in and start using those settings. And yes, it is backing up now. So that's why we see those speeds happening, 21 megabits per, or megabytes per second. So that's pretty fast, which is great. Um, I like to see that happening and, and really see that it's doing what I expect. Again, not a lot of activity here, not really using up much more RAM, so you know, one time machine backup isn't really hurting this thing right now, and it seems to be working well. All right, that's it for part two of TrueNAS. I hope you enjoyed this. hope you got a lot out of it. Stay tuned for part three where we're going to do plug-in installation. We're going to do a NextCloud install through the plug-in system. I think you'll really enjoy it and get a lot out of it. If you're enjoying this, like subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along on the journey with us, and I'll talk to you next time.